we don't want to talk about data protection in general, but uh, how you see it as from outside of the European Union, if you have something similar, or if you feel that data protection is a new barrier to enter markets, so trade barrier, or is it something good against the internet data octopus like Google and the big browser ambitions of some government. And here we would like to see a discussion with all of you uh, and maybe not going too much into detail about what you have to be aware of. If you can't find the discussion, Catherine and me would explain some words and definitions, what you have to be looking for if you enter the European market for doing business there. But maybe you have already some comments. This shouldn't be a lecture from Catherine and me, but a very interactive discussion how you see it. Uh, is data protection something new, good, or is it more like a trade barrier? What do you think? Well, if you want my, my point of view, I think it's very important for privacy issues because you don't want all your information out there. And on another scale, if there is a trade, trade barrier for large companies to get into the market and abuse your privacy information, then I don't see that as a, as a bad thing. So I haven't seen anywhere where this can be abused yet. So uh, I don't know if anyone else feels different. I was certainly, I've had clients and um, app developers who find it very much a barrier to trade because they set up their apps and don't want to charge for the app but they then want to collect data from people in order to um, make it worthwhile for them to provide the app. And then you say to them, well, I'm sorry, you can't, um, you can't do that in Europe. You have to design by privacy. Um, so you have to build privacy into the design of your app. And then that, that means that they end up with the situation where they have to go almost back to, back to square one and start working out, well, do I now have to charge for the app? Do I have to start you know, what, what can I do? Do I have to start saying, getting permission for everything I do, thinking about the data I'm creating, how long must I keep it for? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it is a barrier to trade and it does stop particularly smaller companies. I don't care about big companies um, particularly. You know, they've, they've got the resources to, to deal with pretty much anything you throw at them. But for smaller companies, it's making it difficult for them, I think, to enter the European market. And certainly, like most of my clients are not based in the European Union, and they found it very challenging. They found concepts like ownership of data difficult because they want to say, oh, well, we own the data. And you say, well, I'm sorry, in Europe, only the data subject owns the data. Oh, well, who's a data subject? Well, it's a natural living human being who isn't dead. Oh, OK. Um, and, and it's just that there's an awful, there's a lot of language around it. There's a lot of um, technical terms for people to understand. It makes it difficult for them, A, to grasp the concepts, but B, also to design their products in a way which allows them to enter the market. And sometimes even if they do, uh, it hits their innovation hard. I mean, uh, some companies would like to process data in a way that is innovative, right? And uh, with these laws, these data protection regulations, we say you cannot do that. And then uh, it becomes an issue of, uh, of innovation. I mean, I think in general, data protection is uh, a balance between um, innovation and, and uh, protection of fundamental rights. You create a barrier to entry to market at the expense of protecting the data subjects' rights. So, yeah. Well, but I'm not sure, Joe. Sorry. Just, just one idea. You know, uh, lately I took the time to download the terms of privacy of one of these updates of the software for the iPhone, and it runs for 100 pages. You know, all in legalese, completely opaque. So basically, you forfeit any uh, privacy rights if you want to use the phone. So they will mine your data. And I don't know what's left for the apps themselves because Apple or Google will know everything that you have visited, where we have been. Uh, so it looks like there is a lot of stringent impositions on small fish, 
like small companies, startups uh, trying to do a small app. And uh, a lot of facilities, at least because they have the scale to have a, ba a battalion of lawyers to go through this. Uh, so the playing field is not leveled. You, you got the big collectors of data that we can do nothing about it because you cannot be thrown out of the internet if you don't use either Apple or, well, Facebook, I don't use anymore, but uh, at least Google is something that you cannot avoid. Um, in terms of our small businesses, you know, I have included a, a privacy statement in our terms of business, but basically, at least it, this is my interpretation as per an European, if you do a contract with, with someone, especially if you are a law firm, you have by law to collect a lot of data from that people to start working. That's called know your client and anti-money laundering. You have to have evidence that the person that is talking to you is actually that person that is shown on the passport. You have to ask him where he has a bank account, where his money come from, you see? And all you have to do from my practical point of view is to have the best protection available. So this data from your clients are not accessible for third parties by hackers. But if an hacker can get into the most sophisticated defense mechanisms in the world, like banks, big tech, uh, the United States government, what can we really do to protect the data beyond a reasonable effort? That's my question. Anyone voluntary want to answer Drow? Maybe as an example, I know that there's a case in France against Google uh, where they find Google with a very high fee or a penalty. And if this comes through, it will really hurt Google. You can only do it like this, and I understand. Uh, but Yusuf, you can help me here that in Turkey, if you breach the data protection law in Turkey, it's a criminal offense and the CEO can go to jail, right, Yusuf? Technically, yes. I haven't so far seen any client ending up in jail, <laughs> uh, thankfully. Um, but yes, it is possible. And we had cases where, for instance, there was a consumer uh, that stayed at a hotel chain and the consumer had some problems at the hotel and then uh, he literally filed a criminal complaint against the uh, CEO of the company. And we had to defend the CEO in the court sessions, telling them that there's nothing here against the law with the data protection. So um, even if that doesn't happen, the procedure is quite, uh, quite damaging. So that's a problem in Turkey, quite, 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 quite a big one. Where I see for us, the real big problem is uh, if we leave alone the big ones for our clients, if you think about outsourcing accounting to Turkey, Lebanon, Dubai, India, you will get real problems because all the data has to stay on a secure server here in Europe. And if it's not in a secure server, you have to explain your data protection information that this is secure like it is in the European Union. And I don't know if you realize it that last year we had a big court decision of the European Court of Justice. They decided that uh, the US is no more yeah. a safe harbor for data um, because uh, um, authorities in the US are or can enter your data. So. This is a really big problem for Microsoft, Google, or Apple because we can't use for Office 365, Microsoft Office 365, a US server because this would be illegal and there would be breach of data protection. But let's say I would like to ask Safa to do the accounting for my clients. How sh could I do it? Promising my clients data protection of their data um, maybe only because of uh, data protection rules 
we can't do the business anymore. And is this still what uh, Visam said, rightly a protection of our privacy? Or does it maybe hinder ourselves or foreign companies to enter the market? You can, Visa, you can take the next slide if you want, just by choice. Um, yeah, sure. I'm going to move to the next slide, but just, uh, just something very quick. Uh, Andreas, long time. Pierre Giorgio, long time. Hope you're both uh, doing well. Uh, just just so you're up to speed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Just, just so you're up to speed, uh, we're talking about data protection in Europe. Hello, Wissam. Hello, all. Hi, Andreas. Hi, Andreas. So we're talking about data protection. I just wanted to add something to your comment just now about doing the accounting. You know, uh, I think it's fairly easy if... Uh, if your server, if your accounting is stored on your server, and since everyone is a, it's, it's a cloud-based server, then everyone can access it remotely and do the work for you on your server. Your data is never going to go onto my server outside Europe. It's going to stay on your server and it's going to be used on your server. I don't know. If, I, technically, I think that should work. But access in some cases are still considered as transfer. I know about Europe, maybe, uh, or and. I guess we can expand, but in Turkey, for instance, if you have, uh, say, a company that is a subsidiary of a German company, and this Turkish company has a server in Turkey, but it is being accessed by the German employees in Germany, the Turkish Safe Protection Board considers this to be a transfer from Turkey to abroad, at least uh, makes it subject to the same provisions for cross-border transfer. So that unfortunately doesn't help uh, in Turkey. Yeah, it's similar here. And I had a deal beginning of the year, there was a, a fall from Abu Dhabi buying an investment company in Germany, a small one. And one of the plans was to get all the data and the server of the German, the small German investment company to Abu Dhabi to save uh, resources. And this was one of the critical points of the transaction. And in the end of the day, uh, they couldn't take uh, the data or the investment programs from the German company to Abu Dhabi because out of data protection reasons, which didn't make the buyer very happy. I was representing the buyer and the seller wasn't happy too, but we couldn't get around the issue of data protection. So this was a real issue no one saw in the beginning of the deal. So I think there should be some lobbying at the level of Lebanon and maybe also of the Emirates to, to try to speed up the process of uh, data protection legislation uh, in both countries. Yes, however, there could be a problem. Um, even if you, your government or your laws are the same like the European one, as long as a government is not um, um, accepting the rule of law and uh, takes the right to interfere out of what reason ever to look into my email, uh, this is a breach of data protection like the US. Um, the reason why the US is no safe harbor anymore, it's because of the uh, security or uh, authorities that they take the they liberty have access to, to the emails and everything okay mm. and they take the access mm. even mm. if it's half illegal but if you enter the us you're <sighs> obliged to give your password for some social media things and this is something the european court of justice said is a breach of european data protection the data must be protected from the government too so it's not only the law between the companies but the government has to stick to the rule of data protection law. So let me ask you a question. If you have a case, you're a German lawyer and you have uh, some, some legal case with a Turkish client who's based in Turkey, how, how do you work? How do you do the work? How do you exchange information and emails? Million dollar question. I... Sorry? Sorry? You, sir, you first. Million dollar question. Yeah, but, but the thing is, if there is consent 
Yeah. If the party consent is, is the only mechanism there, I think. If if there is consent yeah. between the parties. So if I go to, to the client and I say, Do you consent to this? And he says yes, then I don't think there is any privacy breach. He can consent for me to share this data, this data, this data, but this data you cannot share it. That, that's, I mean, that's true thing. about you. No. Sorry. Yes, Red? No, I was I was just going to say that it's um there are it, it becomes very political in terms of oh, the countries that are told that they that they are a safe harbor for data. So you have to apply your government has to apply to the European Union to be to be to get an adequacy statement to say that it's a safe place to send data. And the US is currently not deemed to be a safe place to send data. Um, interestingly, I'm, I'm going to bring it up, but Israel is deemed to be a safe place to send data, even though Mossad freely admits that it, um, it, it spies on its own people um, for security reasons. There's always um, security justifications for looking at people's data. Um, but, but as I say, well, if occasionally the European Union takes a view on it and occasionally it doesn't, it hasn't taken a view in the US, it has taken a view in Israel. So again, it begins to feel like trade barrier. And I certainly my American clients feel that quite strongly. Manolis, you can feel free to speak anytime. It's, uh, we don't have to be Hi, so formal. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I just, I just go because everybody's uh... Uh, discussing, so I did not want to interrupt anybody. So thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting discussion. Uh, what I would uh, share is following. First of all, barrier uh, exists, uh, barrier at least uh, in brackets, uh, exists when we have uh, the implementation of GDPR because uh, as it goes more deeply to, uh, to comply, then everybody who wants to have a, a cooperation with another company, every company says that a uh, request that the other one is GDPR compliant. So there are many who are not, so they are excluded from this. This is on the other hand, an incentive for those who have not yet uh, complied. And at least in Greece, there are many who have not because Greece uh, has many small and uh, medium sized companies uh, so for them, it's, it's not that easy to comply. And, uh, but this is an incentive for all of them to do that and to comply. Then uh, on another issue that, uh, it, that was raised, when we exchange uh, a, a documents and data with a non-EU country, then there are some guidelines set by the GDPR, but uh, Apart from consent, for example, when we are lawyers, it's also uh, the professional uh, interest and the, the legitimate interest of our client to have his case uh, solved. And it's a contractual also obligation. So we have a contract of, ser of offering services and we need to implement this contract through asking personal data among other things. So there are some issues I would say that consent in GDPR is the last recourse and uh, should uh, in general be very cautiously approached because consent can always be at any time withdrawn. So we need to have uh, some more stable grounds of uh, receiving uh, data. And when we don't, then yes, we do go to compliance, to consent, sorry. And Visa, you're right. If the client consents to give me some data, this is fine. But if it's a business, the problem is the business doesn't own the data. So if I get anything from any employee, which is defined as personal data, the business needs to go back to the employee and the employee has to give consent. Uh, are you speaking about an employee of the company? So the relationship between is between the company and the employee whose data is processed by the company? Well, if I get any information about the employee, like the payment role, mm -hmm. and this is not anonymized, that I can see who is earning what and know who it is. And this is the personal data of the employee and the employee has to give consent and not the company. 
I think that if it is uh, an employee of the company and you request uh, personal data so that you can uh, uh, serve your employment contract with him, then this is uh, the ground behind that is not consent, but is uh, contract uh, performance. So unless he gives the data, he, unless he gives, for example, his bank account, he cannot uh, have his uh, salary paid there. Unless he says how many children he has, he will not be entitled to some social security allowances uh, which, are, which correspond to this family status. No, I agree with this. I just mean, if my client, a Turkish company, gives me some information for a case here in Germany, and if part of the information is also information about the employee, this is not, uh, this is a real issue. This becomes really complicated and there's a consent of the business unit is not enough. This is only the case then where consent is your only ground for cross-border transfer, I think. Yeah. We're talking about that case, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't argue this. This is good. The question is if it's a business barrier or is it something you have to watch out if you do business abroad? How is it in the URE? For example, do you have data protection? I have to consider when I come to the UAE. Yes, I'm Ahmed. So, sorry. Okay, maybe you can go to the net. Yeah, yeah. Continue. What? A, how is the data protection in your jurisdiction? Do I have to, if I have my case in the UAE or I have a business, do I have to watch out for something or not? Yeah, so, I mean, in the UAE, there's no comprehensive uh, data privacy legislation at the federal level. Um, there is only some things uh, in, so the penal code, for example, uh, contains uh, provisions that govern data use, um, but there is, you know, the, so it's a very patchwork approach here. Um, you know, of you know, DIFC, ADGM, these very sophisticated free zones obviously have very, very uh, advanced regimes, but not, not, not uh, in the mainland. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, only the DIFC and the ADGM. Dubai has uh, one law. But, uh... Dubai has one law, uh, not widely uh, usable. Uh, however, the the practice uh, within the local laws is to do more protection on personal data uh, where it affects the uh, personal image of a person. This is on case by case basis, and it's not uh, business related uh, as in Europe uh, and other countries. It's more of uh, personal status and uh, personal matters. So they are trying to uh, to comply and come up with the federal laws, but it's not there yet. But I, you know, we see businesses businesses that do cross border work are are increasingly embracing the GDP you know GDPR standards. I mean, we we always advise to go with the most you know, burdensome regime, and that's GDPR today. So that's when we're advising on best practices, that was, that's what we turn to. Okay, one topic, I don't know if you are aware of it. I, Kashin, do you want to say something about the data representative or shall I do it? Your microphone is on mute. Catherine? Yes, yeah, sorry. Have to unmute. Yeah. Um, I am. Um, yeah, sure. No, I don't. I don't. I don't mind doing it. Um, if you are going to 
uh, access the data of the personal data of individuals in the European Union or basically do business in the European Union, which may involve the transfer of personal data, then you have to appoint a data representative in a European Union country. Um, and that person has to be available to liaise with the um, data protection regulator in each European country. Um, and that's, I mean, that could be quite onerous. So you, you, know, you, may, have to, you may have to appoint either a law firm or a, a potentially an accountancy firm uh, in an EU country in order to act for you. And as I think um, Urs has pointed out in this slide, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely little industry that's growing up in Europe now so that we can, uh, you know, we're going to provide data protection advice to you and we can support your data protection needs, which to me seems a little bit like the mafia because it gives you protection that you wouldn't need if they didn't exist. Um, and so that's my, that's my take on it, but uh, I, I don't understand why they can't be somebody in your own country. Racketeering is called. Sorry? It's uh, in, in, you, in the United States, they call it racketeering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. What the problem is that a lot of, for example, online shops have this issue and now block e European consumers from entering their online shop because even if you have an online shop in Lebanon, US, Dubai, uh, you need a representative in Europe. If you don't have it, you are not complying with data protection. And there's a good chance that you get fined by the government. So, so 